Dun, 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 dun. All right. Right off the bat, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for any technical difficulties we have. We're still trying to work the bugs out of this thing, but it seems to be working fine right now. So welcome to Dissertation Boot Camp. Brought to you by the Hawk Tutoring Center down here in San Diego. All right, everybody, this is the last one. We're going to save the best for last, the statistical decision tree. Um, a little side note, we're going we're gonna to try to bring this to you on, a, on a, either a weekly or a bi-weekly basis through something we're going to call the dissertation hour, hour, power, power of hour, one of those. But we want to hear from you. What do you want us to go over in the dissertation boot camp? Um, we would like to hear, you know, which school you're from, which program you're in, uh, you know, where where would you like us to try to insert some kind of support materials for you? And there's again, there's a plethora of of different ideas that need to go into this. But again, just let us know what you want us to do. Talk to your classmates, talk to your professors, anything that we could try to help you with. We have a lot of, uh, of talented people down here in San Diego, as well as the other campuses. But we're going to try to put something together for you. We want you guys to graduate, period. Boom. All right, here we go. Statistical decision tree by me. Which statistical analysis will you use? And as if you don't know, there's about a million of them out there. So, but it's it's actually it's very it's very mathematical on which statistic test you're going to use. Okay, so t tests, ANOVAs, regressions, the non-parametric tests, and th these are these are probably about 99% of every test you're going to use will fall under one of those four categories. Okay. The first step in your decision making is you have to identify your variables. Very important. What kind of variables are you talking about? What are you measuring? How are you measuring? With what kind of tools? Are you going to use a survey? Are you going to use archival data? Are you going to take physical measurements of some, some type, right? That kind of thing. So what are your independent variables? In other words, independent variables are they're different for the different tests. So like in the ANOVAs and the T-test, your independent variables is usually a grouping variable. So whoever's in group A is not in group B, et cetera, et cetera. You're comparing separate groups. And then comparing them in what? That is your dependent variable. Whatever you're measuring in every person in the study is your dependent variable. I'll say that again. If, uh, example, if everybody's going to take a survey, then the survey scores are your DB. So here comes the hard part. You have to identify what types of variables you have. I don't, run, I don't know if you remember your research design class or your statistics class, but there's only four types of variables. Nominal, categorical, pretty easy, right? That, that will identify a subject or a participant in your study, either in group A or B or C, male, female, ethnicity, military rank, SES, what are all anything like that that sticks them in a category where a number doesn't make any sense, okay? That's a nominal variable. Number two is a continuous variable. That is what most of us would just call a regular number, where seven is greater than three, okay? So a continuous variable is, is basically a regular number that can have fractions. You can have 7.3. You can have 6.2. It has a zero where zero means zero. There's nothing in that category. That's what a continuous variable is. Uh, it's just a regular number that can have decimals. Ordinal. This is a biggie. If you're using ordinal data, most of the survey stuff you will use will be ordinal data. All Likert scales are ordinal data. Say that again. All Likert scales are ordinal data. So in other words, you've seen them, right? So one means I strongly disagree. Five means I strongly agree. That is rank order data. This is going to come back here in a second. Uh, because if, you, if your DV is ordinal data, then you are kind of constricted in which kind of, which kind of tests you're going to use. So last one is interval data. 
I'm going to be honest here. I have never seen any type of interval data on any of the dissertations here at Alliant, and I've worked on over 500 of them. And anytime I look it up in a book, they always have the exact same example of interval data, and it has something to do with about temperature. And so my advice is don't use interval data, period. So after you identify the types of variables that you have, the second step to making your decisions what are your research questions? Real briefly, what are your research questions? Are you looking for a difference? In other words, does yoga decrease depression? Okay, you hear that word decrease? That means that, that if you had a control group and a yoga group, the yoga, the yoga score should be less than the control group scores. So a difference. If you hear the word difference come out of your mouth, that means you're going to use either a, wait, let me back up. <clears throat> so are you looking for a difference or are you looking for a relationship? So is there a cause and effect? When this variable goes up, does the other variable go up or does it go down or does it not react? Believe it or not, those two things, a difference and a relationship, those are, that's everything in statistics right there. You're either looking for a significant difference or you're looking for a significant relationship. <laughs> that's all it is. You identify your variables, what types they are. You identify what you're looking for. Are you looking for a difference or a relationship? And then from those two, this, this is, it, it becomes automatic, right? Really, I wouldn't lie to you. So, the test you're going to use becomes automatic. It's self-evident. With a couple of uh, addendums here at the, at the last call, I'm going to tell you here in a minute what, what there's going to be a minor change if the data doesn't fit something. So that's okay. So if you, unless your data violates too many of the assumptions of the test, every statistical test that you will run has assumptions about the data. Number one. Your data has to fit a normal distribution. That is not 100% carved in stone with some of the tests. Example, the T-test, the ANOVAs, they're considered very robust tests. If, if, if the normality is not violated too badly, you could still run the test, and the, and the results will still be considered valid. Okay. So, Sika, data should meet... It should be, it, it should be, uh, it's what we call normal data. It should fit a normal frequency. That's the, that's the, the, the bell curve. Right. Okay. So in other words, a normal data set, most of your data will be around the mean of the data. If your data is not, if it's skewed too much, you cannot use a parametric test. You're supposed to switch to a parametric twin brother, a non-parametric version of the same test. So example, if you were using a, if you were doing an ANOVA or a t-test and the data was so skewed where you would not be able to make it normal no matter if you tried to transform it through logarithms or took the inverses or you threw out the outliers, if you still could not get a, a, a semi-normal data, data set, you would switch to a non-parametric version. And there's a couple of them. There's a Kruskal-Wallace test. There's the uh, Wilcoxon's test. There's a couple of them. <clears throat> the difference between a, a parametric test and a non-parametric test is a parametric test uses the means and standard deviations of a data set, a normal data set. A non-parametric uses the medians. Right? Remember that from your old uh, statistics days? A median is, is the data value that separates your data in half. Half of the data will be above the median, half of the data will be below the median. And then it uses counts and, and quarters and percents and stuff like that. But, okay. Again, if your data violates too many of the assumptions, you should use a different analysis. Maybe non-parametric tests. Unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of non-parametric tests that go on G-Power. 
And I think I only threw that in there because I was working on a G Power PowerPoint at the same time. So, <laughs> so let's do an example or two. So you're trying to see if there's a difference between two independent groups. Uh, who runs faster, boys or girls? Okay. Your IV in this case is going to be groups. Whenever you hear the word difference, your IV is always a categorical variable. It's always a grouping variable. And then your DV is whatever you're measuring in, for everybody. So this one would be how fast they run the 100 yard dash or something so, like that. So the that. group is the I IV. Okay. Right. And then the data itself. The yeah, the actual data, whatever the numbers, the physical numbers represent, that is your DV. Okay? And the, it's the DV that has to be normal. We don't care about the IV. Only the dependent variable has to, has to meet the assumptions of the data. So whenever you see the word difference, all of your independent variables are going to be categorical. So independent t-tests, right? Two groups, two stands for t, t-test. If you had more than two groups, you would use the grandson of the t-test, and that is the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, a one-way ANOVA. Don't let these scare you. We have all of these on the Hawk video, on the Hawk Moodles. We got literally about 500 videos that show you how to do every test under the sun, either by hand or in Excel or with SPSS. All right, so again, if you hear the word difference in your research question, you're going to use either a t-test or one of the ANOVA families. There is a ton of ANOVA families. There's a one way, there's a factorial. So the word difference, you're going to use a t-test or an ANOVA. There's three types of t-tests. One is a one sample, that's where you're testing a small sample against a stated population mean. The most popular one you will probably use is an independent t-test. That means you have two separate groups that you're testing something between two separate groups. And the third one is what we call a paired t-test. And that is like a pre and a post. A pre and a post test is a paired t-test. They all three use different calculations. So make sure you're, you're picking the right test for the right situation. And the ANOVAs, there are literally about two different kind, two dozen different kinds of ANOVAs. A one-way ANOVA means you got one IV. A two-way ANOVA means you got two IVs. A six-way ANOVA means you got six IVs. You also have a MANOVA, starts with an M. That means you have more than one dependent variable. You have an ANCOVA. The C in ANCOVA stands for covariate. You're trying to weed out a covariate. And the list goes on and on and on. So the word relation is the cause and effect. We got to be careful. We can't say causality, right? We know that a strong correlation is not the same as causality, but it, it makes the most sense to explain it, right? Does one variable cause another variable to change? So when you're talking about a relation between continuous variables, remember those are the ones that have numbers with, with decimals between them. Um, that's when you get into the correlation family and the regression family. Now, the regression family uses correlations in all its studies. So back to the ANOVAs and the t-tests, the ANOVAs and the t-tests look at means and standard deviations where relational models, they look at the correlations. And there's different kinds of correlations. There's a Pearson, Pearson correlation. That's the, that's the most popular by far. Um, if your data is ordinal, you would switch to the Spearman correlation. And regressions, there again, there's about a million types of different regressions. 
The, the main one is a, uh, a multiple regression. That means you have at, at least two predictor variables. If you're trying to predict something, right, based on a relationship, that makes it a multiple regression model. We call the IVs in a regression model, we call them predictors. And we call the DV either the outcome variable or the criterion variable. Again, don't let the words fool you. They're either IVs or DVs. You have to identify which is which. We did something based on what? Uh, on something else. So let's say you wanted to predict how much a person's going to lose weight. That's the DV. How much weight was lost would be the DV. The IVs would be, you know, your calorie intake per day, how much exercise per day, whether you're on a multivitamin or something like that. So you're using a con one continuous variable to try to predict another continuous variable. You're trying to predict the relationship between the two. Or more than two. Okay. So if you look for the if so if you hear the word relation between categorical variables, you're going to use the chi squared test. So a good example of a relationship between categorical variables would be a question like, are more Republicans male? Are more Republicans male? So the first variable would be political party, right? You got your, Demo your Democrats, your Republicans, your independents. Your other categorical variable would be gender, male and female. Okay, so if you're looking for a relationship between two categorical variables, use a chi-squared test. Very, very important. If your DB is ordinal, in other words, if you're using survey data as your dependent variable, and if you want to see if there's a difference between survey scores, and most of them are Likert scale, Likert scale, you should use a non-parametric test. I'll say that again. It's a very common mistake. If your dependent variable is ordinal, and that goes for regressions, and that goes for ANOVAs as well. If your DB is ordinal, use a non-parametric test. Fortunately for regressions, there's not a lot of non-parametric versions of the regressions. But there is for the other ones, for the ANOVA. Any questions so far? Anybody? I'm starting to lose my voice. Uh, yeah. There's so much typing. Oh, somebody typing. <laughs> no, you can't repeat no, it. No <laughs> okay, never mind. Okay, here we go. Keeping it going. So here, I'm going to give you a few examples of the decision trees. So uh, I'm going to. It's going to take me a minute. I'm going to switch over. They're all in PDF files. Okay, so give me a second. Let's see how we do this. Okay, yeah, it's tough. All right. You will find that if you look at these too long, you will probably have an apoleptic fit or something. They go on and on and on and on and on. They really, really do. Some of these are easier to read than others. This is from somebody I got a long, long time ago. I can't remember. But it is it is kind of easy to read. It's easier to read. It, it's kind of like a binary system. If yes, go here. If no, go there. Okay. And it's got all the different tests over here, which ones you're going to run. Uh, cross levels. What, what cross levels means in these, in these decision trees are repeated measures. In other words, is somebody getting measured more than once? That's what cross levels means. Okay. So if I could read that, I would read that to you. So basically it asks you how many IVs you got. You're going to jump around and, hold on, I'm losing my, where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. Is this PDF available on Moodle? It certainly is. Yeah, everything you see here is already up on Hawk 5. Okay. 
interaction. Oh my goodness. So when you have more than one independent variable, you have to check for what we call interaction between the IVs. And that in itself is an entire new subject. So, but if you do have interaction between two independent variables, what happens is the relationship between a single individual variable and its DV changes when you add another variable in the mix. Does that kind of make sense? So you, you got this mixing of IVs, something about the IVs, when you mix them, they act like a, a, a completely different variable on, in terms of the DV. So if you've got an interaction, then there's all these other kinds of mini tests that you have to break it apart because you want to find out which of the IVs is affecting the DV in which manner. Okay. So this is only one. Let me show you another one. Uh, are you seeing this? Yes. This is our beloved Dr. Gebertz. He is the clinical PhD stats teacher. This is his decision tree. I'll be honest, I think it looks more like a seaweed plantation than a tree. But it's got, basically it's got the same information, right? He asked you about how many DVs do you have? Uh, do your subjects cross levels? In other words, is it a repeated measure? And then he'll have all the parametric tests, all the non-parametric tests, how to use each and every one of them. His goes down a couple of places, right? How many different levels of your independent variable? IV is independent level variable. The, the level means how many subgroups in your IV. So this, this means one IV, you got three groups in that IV. And a between, or if, if it's a between group or within group test. And so you would run this kind of test here. The last page, it, again, it just gets really difficult to read. So these are very, very difficult to read. Don't beat yourself up if you can't follow them because I'll be honest with you, I can only follow them about halfway anyway. So, But I know what all these tests are, and I know when to use them. So when do you use it when you have interaction? What, what is it that you recommend? It depends which test. So if you have interaction in an ANOVA, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to go backwards and, and look at what we call simple effects. Simple? Simple effects. So a good example of an interaction of ANOVA would be, let's say you're trying to measure the number of push-ups a person can do in 60 seconds. That's the DV. You're trying to measure how many push-ups a person can do. So your first IV category is which military service? You got your sailors, marines, soldiers. Okay, so you got three groups from the first IV. Your second IV is gender, male or female. So the interaction, you're going to run your ANOVA, and your ANOVA is going to come back with significant value. That means there's a difference in the groups there somewhere. So when you have a, and it's going to show a significant interaction. What that means is one of the levels of one of your DVs, of one of your IVs, is reacting with one of the other levels of your other IV in such a way that the scores there will be either much higher or much lower than everybody else. So for that example, more than likely you would get whoever would be the, the king of push-ups would more than likely be your Marines males. So that interaction between the male level of gender and the Marine level of military branch that is an interaction, such to the point where those push-ups are much higher or much lower than everybody else. That's interaction for that. Interaction for a multiple regression model is different. Um, what it does was it, is it will take two predictor variables, merge them into a new variable that is a combination of the other two, and the, the software will test to see if this new variable is significantly affecting the DV. 
significantly predicting the dv. If it is, that means you have an interaction between two continuous variables. A good example of that is back to our weight loss program, um, an interaction between calorie intake and exercise minutes. Yes, if a person has low calorie intake, high exercise, they're going to lose a lot more weight than just calorie or intake by themselves. So there's a good example of an interaction with a prediction model, with a multiple regression model. Okay? So, but again, if you're not sure which test to use, email me. I, I've been doing this stuff so long, I can tell you right off the bat which one you should use. And again, if you're comparing two categorical variables, you're going to use a chi-square test. So if you're going to, if you're going to put a Qualtrics survey together, be very careful. Sometimes some people put the answers. The answers are categorical answers. Example, we had a student here who she wanted to see which type of technology people were using to get their news from. So the first question was, um, which, which is your most trusted news source? And her, her options were YouTube, the television, Facebook, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are categorical variables. So if you're gonna, when you when you collect all this information, you're gonna run a categorical comparison test, which means chi squared. Okay. So again, just be very, very careful about how you set up your questions. Let me pull up the last one. This was our beloved Bong Shu. She made this one herself. Much easier to read. So if you have one DV and one IV with one level, you're simply going to use a one sample t-test, right? In other words, you're comparing a, a sample group to a DV group, right? The DV would be the stated mean in this case, okay? And if it's an ordinal data, like if you're using uh, information from a survey or something, you're going to use the Wilcox test. And score data, you're going to use a paired sample t-test. It's just this one is so much easier to read to me personally. Um, but do the levels cross? Again, is it a repeated measure? What's the definition of level? Level is a subgroup. So a good example of level is, so the IV would be named military branch. That's the name of the IV. And then the levels of that would be Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, that kind of thing. Right. So a level is a subgroup in, a, in an IV. Okay. And these are these are most of your non-parametric tests, the big ones that you probably use, right? The Kruskal Wallace, uh, the Friedman's test. The Friedman's test is a repeated measure, non-parametric, and she gives you good hints on what to look for, right? Identify how many levels do they cross, and then she goes back down here. She goes into more detail, right? So if you're looking for a difference. She starts, she basically puts out when to use a two-way ANOVA with a repeated measure, when not to use a repeated measure. And so for correlations, she's got the four different types of correlations here. Again, don't use point by serial. It's, it's silly. <laughs> uh, when to run a ANOVA, when to do a factor analysis. Okay, a factor analysis is not really a test per se. It doesn't look for significant. A factor analysis simply looks at your survey and, and will tell you if your survey is measuring what you think it is. Okay. And then how many different outcomes you have. She goes down and she, she lists all the big ones, right? In, in popularity. Chi-square tests, yeah, you're going to use a chi-square test a lot. We get a lot of chi-square tests. Um, not so many on these other ones, but occasionally we do because the data violated the assumptions or the data was ordinal. And here's the parametric tests. These are, these are the statistical analysis that you guys love so much. <clears throat> and the parametric test is considered much stronger than the non-parametric tests. That's the good news about parametric. The bad news is parametric tests, you're, you usually need about three or four times the sample size than a non-parametric test, okay? So if you're going to worry about sample size, 
you might want to use a non-parametric test because they, they don't need as many samples as the other ones, okay? And then she goes into univariate. That means 1 dB. Multivariate means more than 1 dB. Uh, you can check them all at the same time. That's the beauty about some of these tests. And then she goes on about the assumptions. And what you do if you violate the assumptions, you know, how to try to clean up your data. You can't always pick clean up your data. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The, here's another assumption, homogeneity variance for the following tests. So again, this is my favorite decision tree right here. And there's a lot to it again. You know, usually this is two, at least two semesters of statistics before you learn all this stuff. And I'm here I am trying to give it to you in about a half an hour statement there. So I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Man, I wish I, oh, I just turned it off, didn't I? Son of a gun. Okay. So I'm going to try this, you guys. Stick with me. Stick with me. Stick with me. All right. So you're not seeing anything. Correct. All right. So how do I get to the desktop? I go to the desktop. I open up. Uh, decision tree. There's Curtis. Curtis, we see you. <laughs> and so it's up. So then I go back to Skype. And I go to present programs. Yay. Did it work? Well, you got to click on that first. And I click present. Hey, I'm getting good at this stuff, you guys. Ah. Did it work? It's loading. Yay! Is that? Mm-hmm. All right, so everything, again, everything that we do on these dissertation, you're going to find on the Hawks, especially Hawk 5, okay? Now, the bad news is we, we can't really help you with your dissertation, per se, but if you just you got a question like, I'm not sure which test to use, I'm not sure which measurement it comes out, just go ahead and contact me. And I will, you know, I can usually spend, you know, half hour, 45 minutes trying to get you in the right direction, okay? I'm, I've done so many of these that it's my second nature now. Remember, difference or a relation. Difference or a relation. Now, be careful. A lot of people will say difference. But they mean relation, or vice versa, right? What's the relationship between military branches and how many push-ups they can do? You know, that's not really a relationship. That's a difference, right? So try to try to be as specific as possible. Oh, I think that's it. Brought to you by the Higher Achievement Wisdom and College Tutoring Center and the Tutoring Moodles. So any questions? Anybody got a, a, a decision, statistical decision to make? Only those that are necessary. That is a good question. If you do too many statistics tests, you could be accused of what we call fishing. Which, you know, don't tell anybody, but we all do that. If, especially with SPSS, it's so quick and easy to run these analysis. You tend to start testing every analysis that you can think of because it literally takes about a minute to do it in SPSS. But you should you should keep it down to a minimum. If you do too many tests, you have to do what we call a uh, an alpha error correction, which means you have to divide your critical alpha 0.05 by the actual number of tests. So that drops your critical alpha to a much smaller number, which makes it harder for you to get significance. That's all that means. But I most tests, most dissertations that I have seen and I've worked on, they include t-tests, correlations. Some have ANOVAs, some have regression, some have both. So it just depends on your research question. So if you got five different research questions, you could literally be doing five different tests. So that's, that's not a problem. It's just that the, the, the statistical analysis 
should fit the DV and it should fit the research question.